Bennett is going to be our presenter today, which everybody knows who we right? And if you don't, you need to. <laughs> <laughs> She's um, in the Cultural Resources Natural, sorry, natural Resources <laughs> uh, Specialist. So she's probably the best one that we have that can give you the ins and outs of the butterfly and its cycle. So I'm going to turn it over to Susie, and then afterwards, everybody, we actually have real butterflies up here in a case that you can take a look at afterwards, and then uh, again, help yourself to the, to the swag. All right. Thank you. Okay. Right. So I also want to put a, a shout out to um, Christina Croker, who taught me about Mission Blues and who has taught other people in this room about Mission Blues and who is a real, a real great biologist that we have at our, at our fingertips. So um, I'm just representing what she's taught me and what we've learned in our park um, and other projects that we've got in the park. Um, and also I want to mention that the specimens that we have up here, they are um, archival preserved specimens that were at Fort Crown Kite and are now stored safely in the Presidio in the Archives Department. And we actually have an archival specialist here to make sure that we're treating them properly. And that means only looking at them through the glass, no opening the case. Um, there's a really cool magnifying sheet to look at things and look closely at everything. Um, but they're just up here, we can look at those um, when we turn the lights on after the talk. So um, I, I'm usually used to giving talks on a trail where we can be distracted by pretty things that are flying by. Um, so now I've tried to distract you with pretty images and weird animation on PowerPoint that I'm not very used to. So <laughs> prepare to be dazzled. Um, OK, so what we're going to cover today for this talk is um, just general information on Mission Blues in our park. Um, that includes range, like where we're expecting to find mission blues, um, the different types of life cycle. If you remember back to when you were in kindergarten, you probably remember that caterpillars, well, they start out as eggs, turn to caterpillars, and then morph into butterflies. So we'll talk about that in detail today. Um, trends in our park that we've been seeing, threats um, associated with each different life stage, and um, how that reflects in trends um, that we've been seeing in our park, and how to identify habitat. And then we're also going to talk about what the park is doing to mitigate those threats and to enhance habitat and try to bolster our populations of butterflies in this park. And um, I'm going to try to speed through this because I have about half an hour or so, um, but we can kind of go over that um, and talk about other things um, that I have a few slides for, like how to tell if a butterfly we're looking at is a mission blue, how to tell the sex of mission blue, um, what this, this whole um, species of the year thing is all about, and how we monitor mission blues in our park. So let's just get going. So this is the range of the Mission Blue butterfly. Um, and you can see this is you know, Marin County, San Francisco County, San Mateo. This, um, you kind of see there's a very faint purple line here. And that's sort of the blob that we created based on our current understanding that's not all inclusive. Um, we have a pretty good understanding of where the Mission Blue occurs on the northern end of the range, but the southern end of the range is a lot more iffy, um, which is kind of exciting. It means that there's still a lot more to be learned about Mission Blues. Um, typically, we think about mission blues occurring in these small patches of grass and high up on ridges, um, and they kind of create this nice corridor through these three counties. Um, if you can think about back uh, before, before Westerners came out here um, and started building cities and towns and missions and things like that, um, we probably had a nice contiguous line of this ridge line that was all connected with beautiful grasslands um, that was probably really perfect for mission blues, creating this kind of red corridor that sort of depicts on this map. But now we have wonderful places like San Francisco and San Mateo um, and Sausalito that are kind of breaking up these chunks. So now we have these kind of islands of, of butterflies that aren't connected anymore. Um, so the places where you where you can find butterflies today, roughly, um, Oakwood Valley or Alta Avenue, uh, Fort Baker, the Southern Marin Headlands right here. Um, Twin Peaks, you might have heard there's been some exciting news over there. And San Bruno Mountain in San Mateo County, which is actually the best population of mission blues out there in the whole world. Pretty exciting place. Malagra Ridge, um, right beside Malagra, there's Sky Ridge. And then Sweeney Ridge also has some mission blues. And there's actually mission blues using the Crystal Springs Reservoir that's owned by SFPUC. So we have this really nice assortment of different places, um, mostly managed by different people. We've got GGNRA lands, we've got the city of San Francisco lands, we've got um, county park lands. So we're all trying to protect the butterflies in different ways um, through different people. Um, and just to get some of the kind of paperwork stuff out of the way, um, we all know that the New Species Act was passed in 73. Um, and the goal of that was to protect rare species throughout the US. And 
Mission the Butterfly was one of the very first insects ever to be put on this list. So it was put on the list in 1976. So it's one of the very first butterflies, um, or insects in general, that was protected by this app. Um, it also was the very first subject of a habitat conservation plan, which is now standard practice. But basically that means that in an area where they were expecting development to happen, they wanted to make sure uh, there, was protect the, there were protections for this species while development was happening. So that's why they created a habitat conservation plan. Um, and that was actually for San Bruno Mountain, but that, that's the very first of its kind. Um, in 1984, a recovery plan was made. Um, so it's, it's kind of an important, kind of groundbreaking insect in the world of conservation. One of the very first, first insects to receive that kind of protection. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, I want you all to take a moment and imagine to yourself what a butterfly looks like. So does everybody have kind of an image in their head? Okay, can somebody describe to me what they're seeing in their head? Little tentacles at the tip the of antenna. their head. The antenna, uh-huh. And do they have wings? And there's the wing fluttery, uh -huh. gossamer wings. Gossamer wing, that's good. Um, of course, I always like to swallow tail butterflies. Like this. <laughs> right. I, don't see that, but I know, I know these guys. So okay. Like cool, yeah, that's definitely, you're describing a butterfly really well. It has the two part, well, two different wings, but they're separated in two parts each in the antenna, they fly around. Um, you probably were looking at something in your head like this. Um, so this is, a, this is a female mission blue, and uh, she's nectaring on a buckwheat. Um, and this is, this is her in her winged state, um, very pretty and fluttery, what we're probably all thinking about when we were imagining a mission blue in our head. So does anybody have any guesses about how long an individual mission blue organism lives? I mean the organism itself. Yeah. Exactly. So Asha said a year because Asha knows her stuff. So um, this is a very exciting time of year right now because the mission blue butterfly adults are out, which means we can go outside and actually see them flapping around. Um, but that only happens typically less than two months of the year. The rest of the time they're in some other state. Um, so this is this is the adult stage, and they typically only live as adults. So the wing of things that you were imagining, each individual is only like that for seven to ten days, um, and then it dies. Um, typically we'll have several different individuals living for seven to ten days within a population, so we get kind of a staggered, about two months um, kind of or time frame when we see adult mission blues. Um, but this is only one to three percent of its entire life cycle. So when you guys imagine a mission blue and with its wing wings and antenna, that's only covering about three percent of its whole life cycle. Um, and during that seven to ten days, you can see this, this butterfly has got some wear and tear. Um, it's torn up, um, shredded a little bit. Um, it's probably had a hard life, um, and we'll talk about what it might have been dealing with. How large is that? How large is that butterfly? Butterfly's about the size of a quarter. Pretty small. And uh, we have specimens here, but yeah, it's about, about that big. So, um, I like this picture because it, it kind of describes, or gets the point across that mission blues are hard to photograph. I was trying to take a picture of this butterfly who's sitting on this plantain and then he started flying up. <laughs> you can actually see the, the pollen floating from the plant. Um, but these guys, they're, they're, even though they're hard to photograph because they're good at flying, they're actually not known as good flyers. Um, they're, they're small, like we just said. They're pretty weak. Um, they stay typically about knee level or lower. Um, and they always fly close to the host plants. We'll talk about that being soon. Um, so they don't, they're not very good at, say, crossing a road, for instance, or crossing a tree patch, um, because they're not very good at maneuvering in the wind. They're tiny. Um, they, need to, they need the weather to be really calm and warm um, and not too overcast um, in order for them to fly. So um, while they're doing all this flight behavior, um, they've got two things to do. And the first thing is eat. So adults, actually, they use their proboscis and they'll dip into a flower and suck up nectar. And so that's how they get their sugar to have energy to do the next thing they need to do. Um, and mission blue adults were thought to really be specialists on a few different species in the past. But what we're learning now is that they're actually pretty generalists. They, um, they'll use a lot of different species of different flowers to get that nectar. So, so that's good. Good for them. They seem to be generalizing a little bit in that respect. Um, and then that, sorry if you guys are eating, <laughs> um, this leads to their next goal in adult life, which is mating. Um, and so this picture was actually taken at Oakwood Valley, um, but you can we can actually kind of get a glimpse of the male and the female um, mating um, in order to produce the next life cycle. Um, typically 
remaining can last. In Mission Blues, it's, it's a very slow process. You can sit there and watch them, and they don't really move very much. Um, I've read that some other butterfly species will actually stay hooked together for about two hours, and occasionally, if they start too late and it gets cold, they'll just stay overnight together until they can finish when there's enough warmth for energy. Um, so now we kind of understand adult Mission Blues. They eat, they find mates, and they lay eggs, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but now we're just going to talk about some of the threats that these poor little mission blues have been dealing with. So um, harassment's one of them. Um, that's sort of like invading their space and scaring them to the point where they can't find um, a nectar plant, where they can't find a mate. Um, poaching, that's actually been a pretty big problem. One of the reasons that they're endangered is because um, people want to put them in their pinned collections. Um, so if, and the populations tend to be so small naturally that as soon as you take a few out to put in your pretty collection at home, um, you're really decimating that genetic pool. Um, predation, so um, that we've actually seen animals like um, uh, corvids, like scrub jays and things like that actually eat adult mission blues, just pluck them out of the sky. Um, loss of larval food plants, so um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but that's actually something that if, if there aren't larval food plants for mission blue adults to find, to put their eggs onto, then they can't, they can't do their whole breeding cycle. Um, loss of adult nectar plants, we already mentioned that they need wildflowers to nectar, nectar onto. Um, if there aren't wildflowers, then they don't have that resource. Um, also, we talked about the fact that they're not very good flyers, and um, they might have trouble, say, going over a patch of trees or something like that to get to a new population of butterflies. So we're having these genetic pools where everything is getting inbred. They're not able to spread as much as we'd like. So, um, the park can only do so much, but we try. So um, the way these are set up is yellow are things that we're actually able to do. Black are, are things that we're not currently doing. Um, so we are actively trying to prevent harassment um, by keeping visitors and dogs and other things outside of known sensitive areas. Um, we're also trying to prevent poaching by having law enforcement do patrols if we see people in areas where they're not supposed to be. Um, or we educate them, we're putting up signs, things like that. Predation, there's not much that we can do about. Um, loss of larval food plants, we're actually, we have a whole nursery program and we're working on new developments um, to actually increase the number of larval food plants and not nectar plants. Um, and we're not doing as much as some of us would like um, in regard to bearers dispersal and gene flow. Um, we still have these separate populations throughout the Mission Blue range that aren't connected. Um, and we're, in our parks, we're not actually doing any kinds of reintroduction or anything like that to kind of reinvigorate the gene pool. Um, so, good job guys. Now you know all about Mission Blues in their adult stage. But remember, that's only 3% of the time. So we can talk about the other 97% now. So, um, this is what an egg looks like. And does everybody know what a silver lucin looks like? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's great. It's a little plant, um, and they have what's called leaflets that compose leaves. Kind of, it's called palmately, like your hand compound. Um, and so each of these little fingers is maybe about this big, and this is what the egg size looks like. It's a little round white dot on there. That egg hatches into a caterpillar. Um, caterpillar grows up, and that, that it's only like this, we'll talk about that in a minute, it's for three percent of its life. That hatches, grows a little bit, and it still goes into this diapause stage, it's kind of like hibernation for 90% of its lifetime, and then it um, pupates um, in that three percent of its lifetime into the adult. Now, if we were thinking about adult mission blue butterflies as a representative of, of an individual, that's like saying that you are who you are when you were in high school because that represents 3% of your life. So think about yourself as an entire person with an entire life cycle, lifespan, and these butterflies are the same way. They have these, they go through stages and they grow and they mature just like we do. So um, we've talked a little bit about host plants. Um, this is an overview. Mission blues are actually pretty special. Um, the caterpillars, the the larval stages of mission blues can only use three different species of plants. Um, and in the Marin Headlands, where I do most of my work, we typically have this plant, which is called silverleaf lupin. Um, and uh, it's a very low growing plant, it tends to grow in rocky areas. It's very silvery and it's got pretty deep purple flowers. Um, another species that mission blues use, this is the dominant one at Oakwood Valley, um, in Alta Avenue. Um, it's called summer lupin, and it's actually because it dies back to its rootstock at the end of the summer. But it's pretty difficult to tell it apart um, from a silver leaf lupin. It's also pretty pretty silvery. Um, it's, we, its flowers tend to be a little bit more elongated and it has white touches, but kind of hard to tell. And then the other species of lupin that butterflies use um, or can use 
actually, my experience is between flatter, growing outward. Um, they have redder stems and their flowers are more compact. Um, typically, when we see these species growing in combination, mission blues will always prefer the silver leaf within. Um, and they tend to not really like the very colors in too much, but they will use them if need be. Do you know why that is? One, one theory I read is that the silveriness in the silver lupin is actually caused by hairs, like microscopic hairs, and those hairs kind of create a matrix for the female to lay an egg to, into, so it stays on better. But I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows. Um, okay, so this is what a, this is actually a Lupinus albifrons or silver leaf lupin. We saw at Fort Baker, and I was just doing my my monitoring one day and looked down and saw this little plant, which is about this big at this stage, and it had a bunch of eggs on it. Can you guys see any eggs on here? Yeah. Yeah. Little spots. Yeah, little spots here. One, two, three, four, five. They're all over the place. Um, this little plant actually has ten eggs on it. <laughs> Um, which is not super common. Typically when an adult mission blue butterfly female is deciding where to put down her egg, she's making a very important decision. Not only is she deciding where she put her egg, she's deciding where her baby, where her progeny is going to be relying on for 97% of its lifetime. This, butter, this egg is gonna turn into a caterpillar, the caterpillar's gonna eat this plant, this, that caterpillar is gonna rest under that plant, and then the caterpillar's gonna wake back up, turn into a butterfly on that plant. So it wants to make sure that it's picking the right plant to, to benefit from. Um, okay, so once the egg hatches, and that takes about three to five days, then we go through a series of caterpillars growing up. So the way that insects work is they have exoskeletons that they need to actually shed in order to grow bigger. Um, and each time they molt or shed their skin, that creates what's called an instar, which is just a life stage. Um, so mission boots actually go through four different life stages during their caterpillar stage. Um, and that's when we say, that's what we mean when we talk about instars. So the egg hatches, and this is actually um, a little caterpillar that we saw at Wolfback Ridge. It's probably the youngest caterpillar that we in our park have ever seen, but it's very, very, very tiny. Um, so we'll have some pictures of hands so we can actually have a reference point, but super tiny. Um, and this is just after the egg stage, and it stays like this for about 21 days, and it goes through two sheddings. And then it actually goes into what's called a diapause, which is essentially like a hibernation, but for cold-blooded things. And um, it sort of, it typically drops to the base of the plant um, and just hides out there for the, for the rainy months and the cold months. And that's where, that's where it sort of just rests until it's ready to take the next step. Um, after that, um, it wakes back up, back, wakes back up um, in its new instar and gets really hungry. So the way mission blue larvae eat, and larvae and caterpillar are the same thing. Um, mission blue caterpillars will actually go around, so each of these is a leaflet, um, and this whole thing is a leaf. It'll go around and actually come, I believe, from the bottom. The way plant, plant leaves work is they have two outer edges and then mesophyll in the middle, and that mesophyll is where all the chlorophyll is, that's where plants make, um, that's the, where they make their energy, so there's lots of nitrogen and rich goodies in there. So the caterpillar actually come from the bottom, eat through that outer beautiful part, and kind of scrape out the inside parts, and then leave the top, creating these little windows, of see-through bits, where it's just one layer showing through. Um, and the, the caterpillars are really hungry, they've got a lot to do, a lot of growing to do, and they'll actually kind of decimate this whole leaflet. So this is an example of, um, of one of these caterpillars actually really going to town on this whole leaf. And you can actually see this is where the caterpillar is now. So this is in its third and fourth life, star, life stage. Do you remember before we had a picture of that first star and it was about this big on a leaflet and now it's about the same size as one of these leaflets. So it's really growing up, really chowing down. So I mentioned that the, the hungry caterpillars are really focusing in on that, that nutrient rich inside of the leaf. Well that leaves these really delicious, squishy little green Twinkie looking things um, that are soft and totally not able to defend themselves and full of nitrogen and everybody wants them. So in nature you never have something this this defenseless and um, and delicious for long. Um, one of the things that, that a lot of butterflies have to deal with is parasitism. There's actually an entire genus um, of wasps that specialize in parasitizing caterpillars. So these pictures aren't mission blue caterpillars you might have noticed, but it's an example of one of these wasps actually injecting an egg into a larval caterpillar, that egg will develop in there, eat from the inside out, um, and, and fully develop, hatch out. So that's one of the things that, caterp that all caterpillars need to deal with. Um, yeah, they kind of are pretty looking too. <laughs> um, so one of the things that, 
develop is this really interesting relationship with ants. So um, this is a, a little, uh, it's called Myrmeca Philly. Um, Myrmeca is ant, and then Philly is love. So they have a, a symbiotic relationship with ants, where the ants will actually what's called tend um, these caterpillars. So this picture was taken at San Bruno Mountain. Um, and I'm just going to go to the next slide because it's cooler. Um, so this picture was taken, this video was taken the same day. Um, what these ants do is they'll actually, you can see their little antenna beating. Um, these ants will be around these caterpillars, they'll find a caterpillar, let us see. You can see the little one's going to come up and eat. Um, and that sort of triggers a reaction in the caterpillar. Um, see its little antenna? Um, it actually triggers a reaction where the caterpillar will secrete honeydew, um, which is just a sweet, sugary substance, um, out of its tail end, and the ants will go eat it. Um, and you think, wow, that caterpillar is really nice. It's just feeding all these ants. What's going on here? Um, but what, in reality, what's happening is these ants are actually protecting the mission blues from predators like those wasps we just talked about. So um, a friend of mine who's doing research, who just finished up some research at Stanford doing um, we're looking at the relationship between ants and a closely related butterfly that we'll talk about in a little while, called Acme Blues. She recorded the sound of the wings of a wasp feeding, um, played them to a lupin plant, and ants came up. So it's not a scientific study. They didn't repeat it. Um, but it seems like those ants are really kind of on the lookout. They're patrolling for any invaders. So that's one of the defense systems. Do the, do the ants only feed off of our when they're No. Um, yeah, I don't even know if they if they feed off during diapause. Okay. It tends to be typically when they're moving around. That's what I've always seen. Okay. Um, so we talked about predation um, and this parasitism, but now we can also talk about threats, other threats to larvae. So this is a picture of the rifle range, and um, you can actually see here's here's this. It's it's called a fire road, um, and yeah, you can drive on it, but there's a lot of lupin all over the sides of this area. And we actually see Mission Blues using that area. And one day I was wandering up on the hill and I saw one of our GSA vehicles drive up the fire road and actually try to park off the road like you're supposed to do and run over a bunch of lupin plants. Um, you know, and I ran down the hill and I was like, what are you doing? Um, he was very apologetic. He's actually one of our natural resources staff and he just didn't know. Um, so that's one of the threats is just people driving over or biking over these coast plants. Um, and that tends to have those all those delicious little green twinkies about to be squished. Oops. That. Um, another risk that's not quite as real um, as cars or bicycles is actually hiking. So um, we have a lot of people, <laughs> these are dazzling animates, um, we have a lot of people trying to hike off trails in some areas if they don't know any better. Um, and sometimes that results in people stepping on lupins and thereby stepping on larvae. So that's one of the reasons that you see a lot of fencing and signage going up. Um, is because we're trying to protect these really, really um, vulnerable stages of the life cycle. So, if all those little caterpillars, I think I mentioned that each individual adult female mission blue butterfly can lay up to 200 eggs. Typically, only one to two of those eggs survives into adulthood the following year. So, we just talked about the predation from the wasps and from, um, from well, and then other threats like the driving and the stepping. Um, so past all that, they're able to go through this pupa state. And this is when, this is um, after the diapause, after two life stage, after two instar stages, um, they'll actually go through this pupa stage. Um, and we, did, we haven't actually found any mission blue pupas. We're not really sure what they look like or where they are. Um, but this picture is a carnivore, blue, which is a pretty closely related um, blue butterfly. So it probably looks something like this. Um, and after that, they will actually mature into our adults that we talked about earlier. So, um, so just to review our threats, this is actually a caterpillar, a mission blue caterpillar that was found at Oakwood Valley while they were doing some, um, some larval monitoring that we found dead. Um, and so this is just kind of showing that, yeah, we, we can actually see these threats in our park. It's not just all theoretical that we're talking about. We're actually able to see, see the results of these. Um, so just to review, the park can only do so much, like I said. Um, we can't do much for the parasites that we talked about. Um, we can't do much for desiccation or this, um, these kind of pathogens that are impacting the butterflies on a natural level. We can't do much for predation, um, but we can prevent things like trampling 
and they can prevent things like a laughing and leaping ceiling. So um, I mentioned this earlier, but the way that we typically prevent this trampling is through education, fencing, patrols, um, signs, designating trails to, to, to prevent people from just going all over the hill. Um, and then we also are doing direct outplanting and seeding, and we're looking into some disturbance studies um, to try to encourage movements to grow. So now we're going to talk about how, are there any questions about the butterfly organism itself? Everybody knows everything. Um, so now we're going to talk a little about, about habitat. So this is a picture of Slacker Ridge, and you can see it's got kind of a nice mix with this scrub up here, and then you can see some exposed shirt and grass and lots of wildflowers, and all these are leaping. Um, and we also have this nice disturbed roadside area. Um, and this is all this is all a good mix of stuff. We call this a mosaic of coastal prairie and grassland. And this is what the mission blues need. And again, the really important thing is this host plant. This little leaf leafing. Um, that's what we need to have good habitat. Um, and these lupins tend to be found in disturbed areas um, like this. This is the roadside um, over at the rifle range. And you can see there's not too much grass kind of in between the scrub. Um, we've got a variety of wildflowers and we have that all important silver lupin. Um, does anybody have any guesses about why this lupin is growing in this like red bare area? It, it's about soil. soil. Yeah, so um, the genus lupin actually comes from lupus for wolf um, because they oftentimes saw these lupin plants growing in these areas where there was nothing else growing, like that other hill. And it was thought that the lupins were wolfing or stealing all the nutrients from the soil, when in actuality they're doing the opposite. So lupins fall into the bean family, the Fabaceae family. Um, and what's really cool about this family is they can actually kind of house rhizobium bacteria that's naturally in the soil. They form a gall around it in the roots of the plant. Um, and then they actually utilize that bacteria. So this bacteria is really cool because typically what we have in the air and soil is, is triple bonded nitrogen, or N2, which is just kind of a very stable nitrogen form that plants can't utilize. But what the bacteria can do is actually take that in and transfer it into ammonia. And that's something that, that plants can use. So um, all plants in this family typically have this capability of housing this other bacteria that's in the soil. Um, so that's why you can find, um, find them growing in areas where nothing else typically grows. That's also why plants like French broom and Scotch broom that are fall within this family are really difficult to get rid of because they are really good at finding the nutrients in the soil. So um, this ability to um, take nitrogen from the soil that's in an otherwise unusable form means that lupins can grow really well in disturbed sites. So this is a picture. Um, this is right above Conlomen. Um, this is one of those pesky hillsides that was sliding off into Conlomen from Slacker Ridge that was removed as part of a, the uh, Headlands project. Um, and you can kind of see there's a lot of this bare, rocky soil that probably fell down from up here, um, down here. And there's probably lupins in that area, too. Um, so other things that like these same kind of disturbed areas like lupins like are weeds. Um, so these are invasive plants that are from another area, um, like French broom from the Mediterranean, Monterey pines down from Earth Lipids, um, from Monterey, pampas grass from the, um, from the pampas down in South America, eucalyptus from Australia. All these tend to kind of find disturbed areas and colonize. Um, and without these plants, perhaps um, these lupins would colonize. Um, and oftentimes we talk about invasive species as non-natives, but there actually are native invaders too. So um, typically in a grassland, scrubland mix, um, you have something like, like a landslide or a fire or a tule elk or something that's really disturbing, um, disturbing the system um, and kind of keeping down scrub and allowing grass to survive. Um, but in a system like, like ours, it's really protected where we don't have a lot of landslides and we don't have um, a lot of fires and we don't have those big grazers. Um, the grass, the scrub will actually kind of encroach on the grassland. Um, so you'll have situations like this where the coyote brush is actually kind of impeding on that lupin um, and that makes it harder to find for a little butterfly that's not a very good flyer. So we've actually reported this at our site and we're, we're doing some work on it trying to figure out what to do. Um, another threat that, that the lupins are dealing with um, is its natural fungus that's in the soil that's impacting the, uh, the, the plant itself. So this is actually, these are pictures from last year. 
Um, I believe they were at Malaga Ridge, um, and this, that's, that's the bacteria, I think it's called Coleia trichomus pinei, but it causes some anthracnose, and if anybody's a gardener, they might recognize that, it affects a lot of roses and things like that. Um, but this, this fungus will actually in the soil naturally, um, and it affects all plants, but it seems to affect lupins a lot, and it tends to come out kind of bloom um, in warm, rainy years, like, like 1998 when there was no Nino. Um, and it's been impacting us last year and this year. So typically what we look for when we're identifying this, this species of fungus is um, the entire, this was a whole plant. You can see it's just gray and dead. Um, in the earlier stages, the stems will actually kind of swirl and um, the whole plant just eventually dies, um, which means that any caterpillar using that plant probably isn't gonna survive either. So because of this, we actually try to do a lot of things um, to prevent spreading. This is a soil-borne um, bacteria, so we try to not mix soil around. So if we have tools that we're using in one place, then we go to another place with these and we'll sterilize our material or lice all our boots, um, which is another reason that we try to prevent people from walking around in different habitats because people who aren't doing this might be spreading the pathogen as well. So this is, again, something that we can't prevent, but we can try to minimize our impact. Um, and this is just a map showing um, in 1998, we had a really bad dieback of lupins, um, and in different areas, um, they had different different impacts. Um, some areas were impacted more than 70 percent, some less than 40. So um, we're still trying to kind of get a better understanding about why different plant populations were impacted differently. Um, and you can kind of see these are these are numbers from our monitoring. Um, the top one is Marin Headlands, and the bottom one is Malaga Ridge. And I kind of stretched them out so they were roughly equivalent to years, but you can kind of see that when we started our monitoring back in the mid to early 90s, um, we had a pretty good spike in 97, 97, 96. And then um, as we approached 1998, they would plummet both sites. And you know, think about Southern Marin Headlands up north of the bridge and the Lager Ridge down south of San Mateo. Um, both of these populations were impacted, which means that we definitely see a correlation between this dieback in this um, in the lupin plant and die back in the butterflies. So we always are trying to be on the lookout for any signs of pathogen um, in the lupins that we're monitoring. Um, so just to review again, there's lots of um, threats to lupins and the park can only do so much. And we actually are managing in some ways. We're, um, we actually just um, finished up, well, we're in the process of doing some disturbance projects and we'll talk a little bit about that um, where we're trying to reintroduce those disturbance to kind of create a better balance between scrubland and grassland and hopefully encourage lupins, which sometimes need a little bit of fire to get going um, through their seeping. Um, and hopefully we'll use that information to do large scale prescribed burns to, um, to help, help again balance that scrub and grass um, landscape. Um, then we're also doing non-native species invasion control. Um, and again, we're trying to reduce trampling, which also not only kills the caterpillar, but could kill the lupin as well. Um, and then trying to contain um, the pathogen, and we're actually looking into potentially um, under that if we have better understanding about how each of the three host plants reacts to the pathogen, and maybe doing some augmentation of existing populations to help um, bolster the health of these pop the lupin populations, which should in turn bolster the mission blue populations. So this is that fire and disturbance experiment I was talking about. Um, we used um, it's called a burn box. Um, which is basically a big metal box without a bottom. And you can put it on a grassland um, and light everything on fire inside that little box. Um, and that box just controls it. So this is how we're doing very small scale studies um, just to get a better understanding of everything. So we actually, we coupled, well, tripled <laughs> that treatment. We, um, we burned a small area and then right beside it, we scraped a small area. And right beside that, we didn't do anything. And so just last week, we had a veg crew out there monitoring um, monitoring the effects of that, and they haven't analyzed the data yet, but it's going to be pretty exciting to see how the plant communities are reacting to each of these different treatments and potentially use what they learn um, to manage our lands on a larger scale. Um, and then these are just examples of some invasive species removals. So this is Wolfback Ridge, which is, um, which is one of the park stewardship site, sites. And this is the, um, the wall, the, the rainbow tunnel is, is right here. So this is, you might have already seen this, you probably just don't know it. Um, but this hill expands over that tunnel that you probably drive through whenever you go to Marin. Um, 
again, this is all the yellow stuff is French broom, which is an invasive legume. So again, it has that nitrogen-fixing bacteria in its roots, um, and it can grow in very, very thick, um, thick, scrubby kind of stands that just totally overtake grasslands where we might find the lupins otherwise. Um, and then, so this is 91, and then through the use of volunteers and um, and staff, in 2007 we were able to remove the vast majority of French broom in that area, and we're still doing maintenance. Um, of that, but it's still pretty exciting to see that, that landscape change. Um, okay, this is another area that is of special interest to us. This is Hawk Hill, which is the, the highest point inside the Marin Headlands. Um, and this is a map just showing, um, we've actually, we've, we've understood that this site is really important for butterfly management for a long time. We've done several tree removal projects through different stages um, along, along this slope. So you guys might recognize all the trees at the top of the hill. There used to be trees below the hill, and we actually GPS the stumps of those trees. So that's what these little marks are, little thin trees. Um, and the different patches that you see are actually different stages of, of habitat of lupin plants that we've mapped through time. So it's sort of like a snapshot in time. The darker the color, the, um, the older the data. So the dark blue is from 1998 and 2001 when we merged those. Um, the, the lighter blue is from 2005, um, and the, the lightest blue is 2007. So you kind of see these three comparisons. And you might notice that there's some areas where there's a lot more dark blue than light blue, and vice versa. So um, we're trying to understand, you know, in theory, if we remove a tree, we hope that lupins will come in. And it seems like they might be. We have to do another round of mapping in this area. But um, we've actually have seen mission blues in this, in this area, which is exciting. And we hope that they continue um, increasing in population. Um, another thing that we're doing, or actually doing, is rerouting trails that go through sensitive areas, putting up fences and signs. So in 1998, they did a big project at Malaga Ridge, and they put up these, these less than beautiful signs. <laughs> um, this is Caution Sensitive Wildlife Habitat, um, and there's a lot of information on there, and I'm sure it's all really good information, but it's not necessarily someone's going to stop and read. So, um, and you can see the fence that's, per that's protecting the lupin. So now we have these pretty signs that... Um, try to get to your heart a little bit faster so you don't step on a lupin while you're reading the sign. Um, and you probably have seen those throughout the park. Um, and then we're also doing, we're trying to increase the number of larval food plants or host plants um, through the park. So we collect seeds um, from certain areas and we propagate them in the nursery. Typically propagation is really difficult. You have between 30 and 100% mortality. Um, to treat the seeds you have to um, there's a lot of different techniques. Some involve sandpaper, some involve blowtorch, um, some involve um, soaking, freezing, all kinds of things. Um, and there's that sort of recipes that are developed um, inside the nursery, um, but still you can have up to 100% mortality. So, um, so this is one good thing, and it's a, it's a great thing to do, but it's not necessarily the only thing you should be doing because we're already seeing all this mortality just in the nursery. But then when you plant them in the field, um, like these are from 2004, um, we, you can see we have all these, there's a plant in here, and then we put this deer protection up, um, and I believe that we dig it into the ground a little bit even to help prevent um, gophers from eating the roots and things. Um, even with all this protection and all that work, um, at this site when we we, we checked um, all the stakes, all the wooden sticks are still on the ground, none of the plants survived in this particular area. So not necessarily, um, doesn't seem like this is the best way to go. It's a good step in a management uh, strategy, but we have to keep looking at ways to encourage natural recruitment um, since the propagation doesn't seem to be doing it. And this is probably a worst case scenario. There's other sites where we have had up to 30% survival in the field, which is exciting. So now you really know your stuff, not just the adult life stages. So good can job. I yes, about please. That? I can go to a major plant nursery that sells the horticultural services mm -hmm. and buy it over the Yeah, it's so probably, it, so it's so probably so a different species. Yeah, there's, um, there's Lupinus arboreus, or tree lupin, which is really silvery, and it can have either yellow or purple flowers, and it grows like a bush. Um, and it's, it's almost considered weedy. Yeah. It'll show up anywhere. And is that survival rate significantly different than other native plants that you try to put back in the ground? There's a lot of plants that have various survival rates. There's, a, you know, it's a pretty big um, variance, um, and lupins tend to be one that, you know, when you ask a nursery manager, the great person. We're looking into you know options, and you know people once they find a good recipe um, for growing it, it tends to work. One of the things that we have had in the past is um, 
had fungus issues even in the air, not just the soil, inside the nurseries, and for whatever reason, all these things just seem to be extra sensitive to it. So we've actually um, sold, well not sold, but um, provided seed to other nurseries that aren't within the fog belt further inland, so there's less fungus in the air, and we've asked them to propagate plants and then give them to us. Um, and when we put them in the ground, we have varying levels of success as well. So any other questions? In the, in the planning process, have the typically don't do that in the park. Um, there, are other, there are other organizations like Caltrans, I know they introduce mycorrhizae into the, into the soil before they do planting, but um, typically our areas are so small that we're planting that we hope that naturally occurring fungus and bacteria in the soil will recolonize. Um, and again, it's, you know, we have a pretty good understanding of what's going on, but we don't necessarily know everything, and so we don't necessarily want to be injecting things that might not be local or things like that into the system. Where do butterflies go when it rains? <laughs> Everyone asks that, and I'm, I've never monitored in the rain because you're not supposed to, um, <laughs> so I'm not really sure. I imagine they kind of hide under the plants. Under the leaf, yeah, maybe. yeah, or maybe they find a, a plant with larger leaves that offers them more protection, but I'm not really sure. And are there other insects that pollinate lupins besides mission blue? Yeah, so lupin or mission blues actually don't pollinate lupins. They don't. No, um, lupins are typically bumblebee pollinated. Um, so you'll see big fatty bumblebees um, going among the lupins and butter mission blues. Um, yeah, yeah, the, the lupins are really just there. The, the main purpose of the lupins for mission blues is just to feed the caterpillars and hide them. Yeah. So I have some picture of Chris, did you have a question? Or Bill? studies to really know that for sure. Um, one thing that we didn't mention is that mission blues tend to really like Italian thistle for nectaring plants, which is an invasive species. Um, and so the sites where, where I've seen um, declines in mission blues, we do have a lot of thistles, um, which makes me think that it's the thistles impact of the host plants that might be um, causing a decline and not, not a lack of nectar sources. That said, I am kind of curious um, if we introduce potential nectar plants, if it would help bolster the population, maybe they give the diversity of, of nectar plants, but we just don't know. Yeah, we haven't studied it conclusively. change and temperatures changing, we're probably going to be seeing reflections in, um, in plant populations with different timing for, for um, wildflowers to come out. And it's going to be really interesting to see how that, how that corresponds with when butterflies, when mission blues come out, if they're coming at a time when, they're, when their nectar plants aren't blooming yet, or, um, or vice versa, if the, blue, if the nectar plants bloom and then and are all to seed by the time the adults come out, then that's going to cause an issue as well. So that's one of the things that we're, we're not actively tracking um, as part of the butterfly monitoring, but we are going to be hopefully participating in some statewide um, studies of phenology of plants to um, kind of track that through time. So every time I need to identify, I send a picture to my friend who studies ants. Um, <laughs> um, but one of the one of the major threats we didn't even talk about um, seems to be the invasion of Argentine ants. So there's there's several different species of native ants um, in the park, um, but typically what we see is um, these Argentine ants from Argentina um, coming in, um, probably through topsoil or through building material, things like that. Um, and they all come from a particular population in Argentina, which means that um, that there's just basically one family of, of ants throughout California. Um, and typically ants, you know, like different, if they're from a different colony, they'll fight. Um, but because this is all one family, um, they don't fight one another. So um, 
you just see this range just increasing monumentally. Um, they don't have any of that natural resistance because they're fighting different colonies. So um, I've heard that there's one place in Southern California where there's two different colonies and they create a line in the city and you kind of see ant fights there, but nowhere else. <laughs> um, but uh, we actually have done some, some preliminary surveys where we look at ant species um, throughout the areas where we monitor mission blues in our park. Um, and it seems like there aren't that many native ants in the areas we're looking at. And that's probably because a lot of them are close to former military bases where they're including soil and plants and things like that. Um, so that could have been a source of Argentine ants. Um, the thing with Argentine ants is they will tend the mission blues, you know, tickle them with their, their feelers, antenna, um, and they'll take the honeydew, but they don't have the same level of protective. Um, they, don't, they don't protect the um, caterpillars as much. Um, that said, they are really aggressive and they will probably scare off other insects, um, but it doesn't seem like they stick around, you know, for when that when that one parasitic parasitic wasp comes in. You know what I mean? So um, there is some level of protection, but it's not not doesn't seem to be as good as the native ants. Can you speak a little bit about the dog about this, but as I interpret it, um, uh, some of the major reasons that we have areas closed for dogs is because dogs tend to run off trail um, and they might trample the lupin. So um, in areas where we have lupin plants growing adjacent to trails, um, we have tried to limit the exposure to dogs. And that's not just through dog management plan, that's through just generally like making trails and things like that. Um, so I, it, in, a, in some areas, like at Oakwood Valley, we have had a lot of success with dogs staying out of areas that are um, so I think that that was one of the one of the things that people who were making decisions about where dogs should go throughout the plan were thinking about, you know, how to protect the mission blues. Um, and but they're not always, you know, it's not like mission blues are the reason that dogs are not in one place or the other. Um, I have some pictures of um, close related or at least closely appearing butterflies. Um, so you guys want to see how to identify mission blues? Um, mission blues, um, like I said, they're about the size of a quarter. You can see see somebody's hand here, so they're, they're pretty small. Um, and what's really distinct about mission blues is that they have these, these nice round black dots with white halos in two rows. Um, and that's how you tell it's a mission blue. Um, and when they're, when they're standing still, like in this picture, it's pretty easy. But when they're on, on the wing, it's pretty tough. And that's why it's so great we have these specimens. You can actually kind of see these in real life. Um, there's, there's a few other species of little blue butterflies in the area that it's really hard to, um, to decide what you're looking at until you take its picture. One of those is um, the springager echo blue. Um, and this is about the same size as typically a riparian species, so you'll find them in wetter areas. Um, and they have that really pretty blue on the, on the back. Um, and they have these black dashes, not round dots, and there's only there's not, they're not really organized. Like there's a row here and here, maybe some here. There's no white halos. So this is our spring jar. Um, and they tend to fly a little bit faster. They are a little bit more confident in their flight. Um, the mission blues tend to fly, like I said, knee level and they're kind of, um, they tend to fly kind of sporadically, like, like kind of all over zigzaggy. And um, it's thought that that helps prevent predation, and birds catching them and things. Okay, so now here's silvery blue, or bear's blue. This butterfly is a little bit bigger than the mission blue, um, and it also has these really nice black dots with white halos, but there's only one row. Um, and remember, the mission blue had two rows. So um, these, these are typically found in grassland areas. They have a different host plant. Um, they use vetches and peas, um, not just the lupin. Um, but it's pretty hard to tell these guys apart. Um, they're, I, I think, a little bit stronger flyers, but I've only actually seen one um, that I know of. <laughs> um, and these are African blues, and this is what my friend Jessica was studying with the ants. This is a pretty common species. You'll see them in San Francisco pretty easily. Um, and they, they're a little bit smaller than mission blues, and the blue is a little bit darker, less sky blue. And they also have these orange stripe um, or dots on the front and back of their wings. So you can actually see that when they're flying. Um, or when they're sitting, which is nice. Um, and now we have a quiz for anyone who's feeling advanced. Um, we have five butterflies up here. Some are mission blues and some are not. So anyone want to take any guesses about, about what kind of butterfly this is? And why is it a mission blue? 